Good evening to everybody and welcome. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Stephen Salmoni. I'm one of the members of the board of directors for POG and I'll be the MC for this evening. It's lovely to see all of you and thank you for coming out on a virtual night here. Thank you for all over the country, New York and Tucson and everything. Uh, tonight, we're really delighted to welcome our two readers, Teray Fowler Chapman, dear friend of POG, and Erica Hunt. And uh, before I turn the podium over to Charles Alexander, who will be introducing, who'll be int introducing Teray, sorry, just a couple of uh, business items to mention. Uh, first, POG would like to thank the following organizations and groups for their support, and that includes the Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, the U of A Poetry Center, the U of A English Department, Arizona Quarterly, Czechs Press. If you don't know Czechs Press, you should know Czechs Press. I'm sure you all know Czechs Press. And uh, we'd also like to thank our individual donors for their very generous contributions. And those include our patrons, Charles Alexander, Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Charles Bernstein, Cynthia Hogue, Jason Lagapa, Joan Larkin, Judith LaFay, Cameron Louie, Lisa Martin, John Melillo, Cynthia Miller, Teddy Nathanson, Nancy Quigg, Stephen Romaniello, Stephen Salmoni, Will Stanier, Richard Tavener, David Weiss, and our sponsors, Karen Brennan, Cutthroat a Journal of the Arts and Pamushik, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Anna Lambert, Little Red Leaves and Don Pendergrast, Heidi McDonald, Barbara Miller, Jameson Nonitz, The Oracle Retreat for Writers, Jenna Ostman, Propolis Press, Anthony Sovak, Mariah Starr, and Susan Thackeray. And if anybody is interested in helping us with the donation, you're welcome to visit our website, which is all just one word, www.pogarts, P-O-G-A-R-T-S, Tucson.org. And maybe we could post that at some point in the chat. And uh, you find a form to either become a patron or sponsor or pledge whatever amount that you can or that you'd like. Um, I'd also want to announce our next upcoming reading for the year, which will be February 12th. We'll have Jake Skeets and Jeffrey Higgins, and that'll be a combination of poetry and film. This will also be virtual 6 p.m. by Zoom, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Hope to see you there. Uh, you can visit our website again for our full schedule. We have some really good things coming up in March and April, too. At the conclusion of the reading, like we just said before, we'd like to invite all of you to stay and have a short and formal gathering just to talk and ask questions for our readers. And we'll stay on the same Zoom link for that. And finally, just two more announcements of import. POG intends this to be an inclusive, supportive, and most importantly, a safe space for everyone. If anybody should feel otherwise, please do reach out to one of our directors. And let me ask you all to just raise your hands real quick. Of our directors. Uh, David, if, if you wanted to post my email in the chat, you could send me comments, questions in that regard. We'll, we'll have the chat disabled for the reading, but certainly you can do it before or after. And I also would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home. Tucson, where POG is based, is the ancestral home of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations. And we'd ask that we please just take a moment to reflect upon how in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. That might be a long moment to consider all of that, but I think if I have any hope, it's that the people that we bring to read, including our readers tonight, maybe pushes us a little bit forward each time towards healthier and happier and more loving place and certainly our readers tonight I know do that so I'm so delighted to welcome Erica and Ture and let me have Charles Alexander please take over and say hi to Ture for us. Thank you Stephen <clears throat> you do these welcome so beautifully. Um, I first met uh, Ture Fowler Chapman I think under underneath a tree on Grant Road more than a decade ago at a poetry series that was there on a busy road in Tucson. Since then, uh, he has gone on to found other reading series like Words on the Avenue, showing that this poet believes poetry is and should be everywhere. To be director of the Tucson Poetry Festival, to give a TED talk on the power of poetics, be a National Arts Strategies Creative Community alumni, a Rocky Mountain Southwest Emmy Award nominee, and much more. 
He is a black trans migrant by way of the Sonoran Desert, Boots Bayou, and has indeed accomplished a whole lot in, a, in an arc still progressing by leaps and bounds. You can find his work on media platforms such as the Huffington Post, UA's VOCA, TEDx Tucson, Tucson Weekly, Arizona Public Media's PBS, NPR, and elsewhere. He was the Creative Justice Youth Symposium Facilitator for the Virginia Piper Center for Creative Writing in 2021. Powerful as a poet, all of his work utilizes equitable practices and fosters social change and also works to liberate under-supported populations. Maroon work with the AR of Maroon in brackets is his website of ideas, poetry, visual art, and news. And it states that they, quote, learn much more from the future generation and feel blessed to cultivate a body of work that allows them to learn the power of vulnerability by fostering others' work. You can find much of the spirit of such a bio in the poems, as in Gray's early chapbook, Bread And, where he writes, and I build into myself. Myself builds into parts of you and you. You are a lake of rose water, sweating in the middle of summer, harvesting what's left of the rain, the weight of this world skipping off the weight of your shoulders like stone. These poems are a house I built, and in this house it rains. Just to see the rainbow, that is miraculous, isn't it? That these poems house a voice that builds. It has been a particular joy since that first evening I met Teray to witness and befriend at least a part of this building, these poems, this house, this poet and cultural worker. Please welcome Teray Fowler Chapman. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> my name's Teray. Charles, oh my gosh, we did meet under a tree. It is true. It is. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago that was now. Um, and I'm so grateful um, for people like you and like other lighthouses in the community that truly like raised me um, in this form um, and kept me close to literature. So thank you. Um, speaking of that, Charles is one of the few, I actually don't really, um, I don't know what I, I don't know what I consider myself. I've been focusing a lot on my mental health and focusing on myself. And so I haven't really been performing a lot. Um, and so I've kind of been I'm losing the identity um, poet and really like stepping into being a teacher um, and listener. Um, and so there's very few people that when they're like, do you want to read poems? And I'm like, Charles, sure. Anytime for Charles. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's why I'm here and I think it feels good. Um, and so I want to first um, call in, speaking of teaching, I'm one of my uh, youth in the room. I'm, I teach, I get an opportunity every season to teach um, incarcerated youth poems. And um, this poem is by Jada, who's incarcerated, called Why'd You Go? Mama, why'd you go? I was always cold, sitting in the dark. You said you always loved me, but you didn't know what was best. Like, why? I always loved you, but you pushed me away. And it was hard not to cry, always whooping me calling me, cutting on my hair, pulling on my clothes, my skin, my look, my teeth. So now that my students are here, um, I wanna call in my ancestors and my first poem is called Us and it's for every trans person on the planet. And if you listen, um, you could hear it. That is the sound of butterfly wings bursting into flight for the first time. We are dancing on the fire again and again and again. We are the genesis of generation. We are the beginning, we are gods. We are the blueprint of the bodies before binaries, brutality, bought and sold, bought and sold, bought and sold us. See, we are gold. We are royal, we are kingdoms, we are of every plight. 
We are the politic ticking. We are what the government refuses to protect. So we are what is killed and can't even be fathomed. We are bobbing and weaving this world together like wind and we are holding and we are held. Even if by only us, we are held and we are loved and we love even what's most unloving to us at times, we are time running out. We are time standing still. We are what bleeds. We are what wasn't said. We are here to tell our own story. We are the visible in a world that chooses invisibility. We are visible shouting that we are here. We have always been here. So they are names. The names that came and named us say Marsha P. Johnson. They Lucy Hicks Anderson, say William Little Axe Broadnax, say Waywa, say Carlette Brown, say Avon Wilson, say Delissa Newton, say Mary Jones, say Sylvia Rivera, say our names. The names slashed and slain yet became just to name us, say Ashanti Carmen, say Claire Legato, say Malaysia Booker, say Tamika Washington, say Paris Cameron, say Chanel, say Lindsay, say Chanel Scurlock, say Zoe Spears, say Johanna Medina, and say your sister, and say your mother too, and say you are still counting. Say that could be any one of us, and then say those that go unnamed. Say those that have yet to be named. And that is just us in this country alone, in this state or in Tucson or in this desert or on this night, it often feels like there aren't many of us, you know? But less is more, there's plenty of us. So say our names. Thanks. It's interesting. This is my first time reading um, in a, I think in a virtual setting. So I'm like, oh, I'm here for the emojis. I think those are like snaps, right? <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Um, this next poem I have, I only have a few more left, um, but this next poem I have is called My Twin Sister is a Hurricane. Um, yeah, it goes like this. I'm trying not to lose everything I know to become, no, actually I do, I wanna introduce this poem. So um, this is called My Twin Sister is a Hurricane and um, it's a poem that was written, a lot of people don't know this about me in Tucson, but um, what really started my mental health journey and really also like my abstaining from alcohol and sobriety um, was I was teaching um, at a high school at where a gun was pulled on me um, for being black and I was walking across the crosswalk and the gunman, um, was afraid because we were sharing the same crosswalk and he got scared. And um, I didn't really do anything much at that time. Um, I just kind of kept performing and things like that. And then things kind of caught up with me. And I had to really start addressing the ways that I was coping with my blackness and with his anti-blackness. Um, and so um, I got sober and um, started going to a program. Um, and yeah, and then that meant that I really had to start looking at, do I really like performing? Do I really like writing? And what is the reason why? Um, because everything up to that crosswalk definitely changed after that day. So now with that said, this poem is called My Twin Sister is a Hurricane. I'm trying not to lose everything I know to become what I always knew. For months, I stood in the mirror grabbed my manhood by the blood, grinned grit moonlight bone and pulled. Every night I break like firework in night sky, delirious and lynch necked all, snapped back in star staring all, reflection I was birthed and was never born. I was birthed and was never born. I was birthed and was never born. I was birthed and I was never born until palm opened dropping all that sky in the center of that crosswalk under a pecan sun in between gold and gunshot. And I was breathing, don't shoot. Katrina, I too was born in open flood. Um. 
Um, cool. So um, one of the things that, um, yeah, this new journey has brought me is um, it's brought me to a, a beautiful MFA program um, and it brought me to school and I have straight A's, which I'm really excited about because it's like the first time in my life. And I like put my own poems on my refrigerator with magnets and it's a whole thing, me and my inner child. Um, but it's important. Um, you can always, you know, repair and give these moments back to yourself. And so what I learned um, in school was um, actually how much I like, uh, like forms, like poems with rules. They're kind of like crossword, like crossword puzzles. And I'm never, I don't know. <laughs> I like it. It's like my version of Sudoku. <laughs> so whatever. Um, with that said, I'm like sure there's like some folks in here that like forms have been around forever. But for me, it's like the newest like drop in hip hop. It's the coolest thing. That and some like old school poets. But anyways, we'll talk about that later, maybe after, after the reading. Uh, this poem is called How to Know a Quarantine is Coming to an End. And I'm still new in the program, so new that I can't tell you what type of form this is, but it is a form, and you'll see. Every morning is an open prayer to the sun. The pandemic of the masked black body, I can't breathe. The country is folding open again, and you can tell because George Floyd was murdered. The strange fruit is being harvested for the seed. Every morning is an open prayer to the sun until Brianna Taylor was slaughtered and planted and watered and grown to bleed. The country is folding open again, and you can tell because then Tony McDade was killed. A smoke screen, an idea of the feeling of free. Every morning is an open prayer for the sun. Then Malaysia Booker was silenced and beaten and collected and unseen. The country is folding open again, and you can tell because the blood etched into our reflection is nothing but a living memory. Every morning is an open prayer to the sun. The country is folding open again, and because you can tell. Well, I have two more poems. Um, this next one's called How I Birthed My Body Whole, an Ode to My Entire Black Body. I don't remember what day it was. I was a fragment of myself then, a small poem still trying to write a world around me that wouldn't break. My words stood in the middle of my chest. My voice sounded like a home that felt like a faint memory. I still remember the way the baritone danced beneath my skin back then, the way the subtle boom sashayed in the socket of bone later that day. My becoming, a returned cadence of resilience and shape-shifting medicine. My first honest cry was stark and it was aching and it is still the prettiest sunset I have ever sank into, a plunge into the center of my thigh a subtle push awaken an open flood, an ancestral waves of echo of brown and black children bursting into joy and pain beneath my spine. All of us, before me and me now, are unlearning and unraveling to unlearn again, even in the explosion of my vigilance like landmines. Even then, my birth is the prettiest sun I know. I am the prettiest son I know. I am whole in a laborious birthright. The thought of that made me free. And to break free meant I had to define freedom. So freedom is born on the corner of black womanhood. See, I am a man and I am where I come from too. So in this lifetime, I am both sacred and regal been hunted for different reasons, reasons and protected just the same. I am more magic, less miracle. And even in then, an explosion of my vigilance like landmines, even on those days, I am. Linda says, yes, so that means that Okay, I can sleep at night. I mean, <laughs> means I must have done something right. All right, this is the last poem. And this poem's for me. And it's also for you. Or maybe someone you know. And it's called The One That Still Suffers. 
I still believe in the unbelieving. I believe I could break a lever and still want the pieces. That most moments are exactly what they seem. I believe behind my ugliest fear must be my quietest dream. I believe in the days that are afraid to live. And I believe in the ones that are afraid to die. I believe the bravest second births a minute. And I believe in a higher power that is greater than time. I believe I have a blue book for a mother and a red book for a father too. And anywhere in this world, I do believe I have a room for the ones that are suffering inside and the ones suffering outside of this poem. I want you to know that I believe in you too. I believe in the final bottle that dries and crusts into a heavy load because I too am a deferred dream who only knew once how to explore. Thank you so much. So excited to hear um, and honored to be in good company with Erica Hunt. I'm like mind blown at what this future has aligned for me. And I'm so grateful that I'm still here um, and stuck out to witness it. I can't wait to hear you read and thank you all for listening. Jure, my goodness. It's, I've heard you read a lot over the years. I think I was there at that same tree years ago. I didn't know that was the first time you all met, but uh, wow, I'm just enthralled. So thank you. Thank you for that. I have you every time. Come read for us. Uh, we have a special surprise guest, uh, Charles Bernstein, to introduce Erica. Oh. <laughs> so, just keep that this is your life. Dad. You also have your high school teachers from Bronx Science. <laughs> You remember Mrs. Johnson, <laughs> your social studies teacher? Or Mr. Hanauer, <laughs> my history teacher. We, we went to the same high school. Anyway, continue on. I'm sorry. Here's a Please. <clears throat> I okay. yield the virtual floor to you. Okay. Well, uh, uh, they've asked me to introduce uh, Erica, which is a great uh, pleasure. And I was thinking, you know, what to do and had so much to say. I don't want to take too much time. And uh, so I went to my shelf, which you could have seen if you were early on, the, the bookshelves that was up where Susan is. And I, I pulled down my, uh, my, my group of Erica um, books. And it, 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 this is the way it was on the shelf. Now, it, interestingly, what I found was that it's framed by, uh, by two books. It's framed by um, uh, Langston Hughes, Montage of a Dream Deferred, and Zora Neale Hurston. I, I, I was very surprised. You, you must have realized this, Eric. I mean, I never, you know, Alphabet is fantastic. I, I didn't make that up. It's exactly the way it was on the bookshelf with these two books around dress. And I thought, wow, this is such a, why, why would I have to introduce you? I just, this is it, bracketed. Because I think in particular, I love this as a, or the first edition of the Montage of a Dream Deferred. I mean, um, it's a particularly resonant book for uh, Eric Hunt's work, I think. Um, and um, I really um, not only love, love that book, but I think what he's doing there with the collage, with the sense of the city, uh, because Erica grows up in uh, New York City, uh, as 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 I I did, and as I said, we both went to the same high school, and and then uh, you know I love myself when I am laughing. Of course, is also a kind of a Huntian motif. So what I thought then to do would be just to kind of go through a uh, a few of Erica's books and and hold them up, uh, which I think I could do. Yeah. So this was her first book, Roof Books, mm -hmm. and uh, Local History, a wonderful uh, book. And, uh, and take a look at this picture. I didn't remember this picture. I, I think it's really uh, by George Tisch. It's a quite extraordinary picture of Erica. Now, I knew her for many years before this book came out. I met her in the 70s. And I want to read the two blurbs from this book because some of you will have other works of hers, but maybe not. The first is from Harriet Mullen. Erica Hunt's local history blows the public and the personal inside out estranging familiar forms of writing, letter and diary, while snatching moments of intimacy and insight in disembodied prose 
that anatomizes artifacts of mass culture, such as screenplay and cartoon strip, with an unflinching eye for the city's gray demise and a concern for, quote, the spine of human scale, this work reads like a coolly oracular yet undeniably urgent communication from a Sybil who makes language a virtuous reality, which I think is a, actually a very beautiful and prescient, because I think that this really holds up through the body of uh, Erica's work over the 30 years that followed. And I have the other blurb on this, and uh, I kind of think it also speaks to what I still think of Erica's work. Local history, Erica Hunt's first book, is the product of over a decade of intensive engagement with poetry. Hunt's resonant and elegant reworking of prose as a form for poetry reflects her social commitment to an ethical writing practice that exuberantly interrogates its own expressive potentialities. A new poet demands new readers. Hunt's poetry it seems to me, demands a new public. <laughs> so I, I actually, you know, I'm, I, I, I still like that. I think that that says a lot about uh, Erica Hunt's work in the way that I read it. Um, now I'm just going to do the flash these books because it's kind of fun show and tell. This is a beautiful book, Arcade, uh, published by Kelsey Street Books. And uh, it has... Um, uh, uh, drawings by Alison Saar, the great Alison Saar. So um, uh, here's, a, here's a spread from that. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a great book. And then I'm not going to say necessarily that much. There's a few chapbooks here, which also were later collected in part. Time Slips Right Before Your Eyes. Mm. Pierce Logic. And um, and actually, another edition with the, the great cover there of, of the time slips right before your eyes. One was from Belladonna. Well, they're both Belladonna. They're both Belladonna editions. Um, then coming closer to the present, we have Veronica, a suite in six parts from Selva Oscura Press. All right. And I want to dwell just for a second more on this this book, which I think uh, has not gotten the quite the attention that it needs because it's one of the major anthologies of the last decade. Uh, it's uh, edited with uh, by Erica and also Don Lundy Martin, Letters to the Future: Black Women Radical Writing, and uh, uh, given the great interest in questions of addressed in this book, uh, it uh, it would seem to be a must for anybody interested in contemporary uh, poetics. It's a, an extraordinary editing a work. It's actually the only large scale edited uh, book that er Erica has uh, done. And so it reflects really a lifetime of research engagement, this historical material that she found there, many contemporary poets. And uh, I can't uh, uh, recommend it uh, and extol it. Now, Mostly the last couple of years, it's this book that's gotten the attention and it's the perfect, you know, jump the clock, beautiful uh, night boat, um, selected poems with substantial um, selections from each of the each of the books that I that I showed you. So let me just uh, say before Erica comes on uh, that for me, her work is marked by its socially grounded exploration of form, or you might equally say it's formally radical investigation of the social. It's my pleasure from Brooklyn, New York, to welcome Eric Hunt, also in Brooklyn, New York, out to you in Zoom land. <laughs> Why, thank you, Charles. Boy, you almost embarrassed me to the point that I... <laughs> into silence. But no. <laughs> um, 
also, I, I do want to mention um, before I begin, um, uh, besides, yes, and I'm also on the land of the Lenape and boy, do we recognize that for a minute, just to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement um, and take a moment there. And then also to mention, Chax published a small chapbook called A Day and Its Approximates. So that too, which is collected in Jump the Clock, a couple of poems. And uh, I'm very pleased to be with you all this evening, uh, virtually. Um, I, I, I really like Tucson. And I've been there several times with you guys, uh, with the poets there. And I even was a guest at the Poets, uh, poets Library there. Yeah, which is extraordinary experience. I'm gonna read, open with a uh, poem that was in a day and its approximates. And uh, it was liked so well that uh, Kelly Ryder's house at Penn made it into a little postcard. So see it as a little life. Reader, we were meant to meet. Reader, we were meant to meet and not disappear in the dredging the edited ledgers omit antiphonal groans. Reader, you are meant to be legible, even in the failure to communicate. Your will to resist snatching defeat from the jaws of easy victory, where the truth slips in as a figure of speech. Reader, step into my room. This page faces you. What will I miss if you blink? What blots the ink, pens and hems the imagination? What hides in the brackish backstories hostile to the wobbled word? What resists being pinned to the truth? Reader, we are carbon and more. The exact degree of life is inestimable. Some of us chew ice and others suck chalk. Some crave salt before there is savor. Others can never be too full of sugar or bourbon to be sucker punched and stunned by death's pugnacious brawl into dream time and song, extending both ends night into day. Touch reader, we were meant to touch, to exchange definitions and feed the pulse of language. I promise if you step in, it will propel you, me, it, topple distinctions, ease, doubt, and belief, and all that is in between. Fool for love. I cannot claim rigor or music, blindfold, blindfold or hormone heated hunger. I cannot claim ache, my bulb dimmed or exhausted. The binary phantom has stopped breathing calamity in my direction. I cannot claim mistaken destiny or a hole in the cards of singularity. A dull solitaire never wins or loses. I cannot claim habit haunts an empty chair or drives me to disestablished echo. I cannot claim arousal by flame sputter, fire drowned in crackle. I cannot claim amnesia, that abandoned plastic bag bursting burning testimonies by the curb, discarded with damp coffee grinds. I cannot claim perfect enthusiasm. I grit my risk against high drama, yet flowers appear eye to eye. I cannot claim my grain is porous and thunder, ready to soak in less heaven and more earth, a ton of mud. I cannot claim my double won't appear when I least expect her, 
throwing a tantrum and galoshes, following her thumbprints. She blows things out of proportion and she doesn't always use her name. I'll read a couple more from this, but I wanna read some new work. So I'm gonna leave room for that. Uh, I'll read a little bit from Veronica, but then I'll um, jump to new work. Suspicious activity. It's a quote from a newspaper article. 43% of the people killed were not in the middle of committing a crime, but were stopped for suspicious activity. There's a data point. Arresting face. She abandoned the cloud and chose to go out on foot. She was missing a grin. She knocked at the wrong intersection. He defeated a match stick. He crossed diagonals. They moved past an uncovered spot. They lost pump. He was bowing in erratic directions. She ran by spurious gloat. They were potential troublemakers, did not fit the turned down dressing of the neighborhood, speaking in concealed carry. He bolted out, cork dizzy, thinking free from the lockdown. She traced the body that refused to fit a grammar of disappearances. She studied how black people getting excited in a manner different than others drive some people to blunt displays of panic and violence. She studied how black people getting elected in a manner broader than others drive some people to blunt displays of panic and violence. Lamenting in an appropriate structure has rendered her hoarse from not screaming. She is blind from reading from the inside of her lids. And I would show you where it happened on a map, but the cursor of the public's attention has vanished. So I started writing something called um, History, the Selective Use of the Past Tense. And I, it's sort of a memoir. It's a kind of a, de I, I, I said, what would a decolonized memoir look like? So I started writing that, um, and this is where I got. Um, one, I was born five years before my first lie. My intention was self-preservation. Isn't that always the motive to fill my eyes with yes? Or was it possible to go back to Eden without making the mistake of first mistakes? mistaking myself with perfection's shroud. The past was in my eyes, the yes, yes to the heat wave and yes to summer long waits for my turn and yes to animal sensations of warm skin and flight. I was five when I became aware that it was possible to lie. Do you remember your first lie by the way? So that's what this sort of was. It was like me remembering my very first lie. I was five when I became aware that it was possible to lie. My parents carried pictures of me in their wallets and I was regarded as someone no one would ever be surprised by. I was docile and safe. I was a child of episodic tensions, observing the tempo and therefore not always separable from my parents. I was a child attentive to merit, eager for a flowered dress, the goodness affirming snap of plastic hair barrettes shaped like animals, the pleasant agreement of tongue teased licorice. I tarried on the threshold of tame, unready for how good fortune is delayed and how few events interrupt boredom. Inside, I chased the desire from motion against the background of stillness, the will to be in constant agitation, unraveling the flowered dress. Motion! Instead of patent leather shoes, I wanted winged feet. 
And this is how it happened. I sailed over the first gate, taking it in one bound, my dirndl skirt ballooning, my feet made a final push against earth, propelled me over the barrier, my legs scissor kicked as if to meet the sky. I jumped. I jumped at the second chance to do it again over the low swinging gate, the low swinging chain separating the cement bound from the domesticated, over the marked terrains of public housing, the reservation landscape, over the homelands designed for the working man and woman, over architecture flash built to the house to house returning World War II veterans and their families, pushing their perambulators, their baby boom armadas, the hardscape concrete and hurricane fence. I jumped the fence without calculating landfall. I crowed triumphant, my eyes gazing upward, singing in my joints elevation, what I thought I knew then, surmounted the prohibitions and the censorship of locked gates. The gates seemed incidental, like fallen trees. What did a high bar mean to me? No one was more surprised than me that I could not fly that I fell from the fence parallel to the walk and landed awkward on my left arm, fracturing a bone, the ulna. I told my mother and father the truth in the doses I thought we could all bear. Not a fall from the fence, I tripped. You can imagine a small girl stumbling, trips, but she doesn't fall far. Then maybe the fall was from someplace higher a fall from the gate. Then I didn't fall, I was pushed. The first lie I ever told was about falling without admitting that I was unable to fly. I told my father Thomas that someone had pulled me down to earth, substituting for gravity an imagined adversary. I told him a girl pushed me when I had simply fallen to earth, broken, my arm, broken the spell and my arm. Death seldom announces itself and appears in disguise to the young. At five, a black girl is a local decoration, not visible enough to be erased. A black girl at five is, a, is at a distance from the center of gravity. She stays briefly oscillating on the field of innocence. Yet gravity's glory is its brutal strength. The way a, push become, the way a fall becomes a push and a push leads down a steep slope towards a stealthily patient death. You know, I don't remember this until I was reminded how Thomas added my story of the girl's push to the story of a thousand other indignities. And he tornadoed out the apartment door, down the stairs, bypassing the elevator. How he hurricaned into the streets with a baseball bat. No, armed with a comb. No, armed with a wallet. No, almost bare chested in a sleeveless undershirt, a terrible rage on his face. For his anger alone, he could have been arrested, arraigned for wrath. My mother and sister ran after him, following first at a distance, then closing the gap as he grew closer to the girl's parents, who were equally furious, for they had gotten wind of my lie, the whole collision in the small concrete plaza, speeding up until my mother and sister arrived to thrust themselves into a combustible mix of lie, bruise, and wrong, where they met, turning into stone before the irreversible, immolating plunge. The summer I broke my arm, a lie yanked me back to earth. That summer I realized Thomas loved me to the point of catastrophe. A little more time. I have another new piece. Try to, I'm not gonna read it all. I was gonna read a lot of it. I'm not gonna read it all. Um, See what I can read. I think I'll read the, the funny part <laughs> of this. Um, this. 
So I've been writing this piece about, it's a parable. And uh, the main character is uh, Scheherazade. And uh, uh, as in, you know, A Thousand and One Nights. And it's a meditation. It becomes uh, it becomes a, 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 a way for me to bring together several threads. Storytelling, Scheherazade, right? Tells the story that basically keeps the boss from killing yet another woman. So it's a it's it's also a way for me to talk about violence um, against women, really, and um, women identified people. It's the pervasiveness of violence, but it's also storytelling and what it does to sort of delay the violence and the ways that we use stories. I guess that's okay. <clears throat> I'll read the first and I'll read the very first piece and then I'll read uh, a little bit of it. Scheherazade was not exactly known for her love of stories. She was careful not to let her love of stories show too much. Yet she also was known as a good storyteller once you got to know her and she felt sufficiently comfortable with you. Then she would let her alter ego slip and her audience would find itself drawn into the world of her story. Or more accurately, the audience would find itself the protagonist in the world of her story. She considers this image more deeply. Babel speaks for the first time. It is hard to know if this is the first time or it follows in a sequence of repeated attempts to give first person testimony on the results of this enterprise. You see, the people in Babel were entombed in the base of the pedestal, and they are released now and at last free to speak. They speak their minds. They both create the white and the page, and they populate it with their size, with, which in the spirit of the linguistic universalism with which Babel was created is written with the same phonetic equivalence and acoustics, though it isn't precisely translatable from one language to the other. Their sighs resemble a long line of footsteps going north, then east, and then through all the cardinal points. At one point, their sighs cluster a solid mass like a hill or a mountain of sighs. Babel stands at the beginning of the story, she thinks. Babel is the landmark for where the dream is common and flattened in language surfaces, the dream of a language that is a mirror where our memories, our traumas and accidents and disappointments can be represented completely as if an instruction diagram, circuits of return and resemblance. Shahrazad was anxiously aware that a critical misstep might cost her life or her sister's life. Stories that lingered over long in muffled discretion were not likely to keep the boss's attention. No, her audience would easily detect and dismiss any tepid small talk, mild deflections to the boss's vanity. The boss was in the business of making news, the news about him, daily awash in the casual brutalities of cable news. It's, if it bleeds, it leads ecosystem, multiplying blinding lines of local news. There was a formula for these stories, headless body found in a bitch, ditch, a seller of imprisoned girls, the synapse snapping collapse of the grieving mother spat out on the screen as she is forced to behold her child's body. These were the commonplaces that fed ravenous eyes, turned love into embers, reminded the boss's subjects to behave. The subjects learned to turn natural outrage into defensive indifference, or just as bad, an unchecked cancer on conscience, picked its location on their bodies, their skin, the pancreas, the lung, the brain. It was like this now, along with scented oils and pedicures, meth, freezers of ice cream and beer, the way of the world. The stories were smirks. More happens, more, more, more. <laughs> Shahrazad began to prepare again. She had planned a dinner party of translators and was readying the guest list. This was not the first time assembling the guest list and she found herself using the task as one would to count sheep on a sleepless night. 
It was the it was the solution she returned to on this all important sleepless night, the one before she tells stories, during the first waking night of a ser- uh, of serial ascents from the depth of sleep. She reviewed her calculations. The French speaker with another French speaker. I suppose the French speaker is also fluent in Wolof, so that is a group. But who will the German speaker speak to? She went through the list again, hoping this time to count backwards and maybe get a different result. Oh, I know, the German speaker might make a good dinner part partner with the philosopher, though that might not be a stretch. The German translator was really Czech. And then there was the Chinese translator who was Korean, a Korean born in Britain, but also a philosopher. Perhaps they could all be in the German's group. And what's on the menu? She began to drift away. It has to be as ambitious as their tongues. The menu as babble. Vegetarian with red meat options. Sweetbreads, salty cabbage, pickled onions, herbaceous tabbouleh. Hmm, ripe cheese, fermented tofu. (laughs) Fermented tofu paste. Smoky beans, sour lemons, fruity pudding, brimming with terroir. Now that she had gathered the storytellers, one of them asked, what is your philosophy of the story? Such an abstract question leading itself away from the starting point of solving her goal, which was to tell a story that would would divert the boss and suspend time. Too much scrutiny, like overstudying the black cherry and the black cherry soda, removing its pucker and focusing on the can instead of the drink. She took a sip as she considered pausing to feel its artificial syrup beneath the space left by the remains of fruit. Was it like that? First the direct experience and then the toil of collecting evidence and then the retelling, wounds fresh, later the healing or scar tissue, keloid, calloused, skin tightened, tears dried now, stubborn streaks of salt washed from cheeks, chin, memory embered, ready to gut punch, lay in ambush, a gesture, she remembers her mother's fingers lifting and stroking her neck to find the seams, to lay flat in a collar that is no longer there. The story is never still, but animate, restless under the placid surface of the past. Okay, two more pieces of the Scheherazade. Another member of the storytelling team said that in a good story, one sees only oneself. At first, this thought disturbed Scheherazade, that idea of endless self-regard, the idea of storytelling as a kind of compulsive mirror polishing. It turned her off. The more she thought about it, perhaps that was what she was expected to do for the boss tell a story that reflected well on him. It was a convention after all to tell the boss that his image was all that mattered, contained all truth, all majesty, beauty, goodness, potential, the last and final word. Maybe that is what a story offers. You enter it and what you take when you leave it, when you think it has offered the final word, isn't at all. Last piece of this. Scheherazade thought about the deception of the final word. Didn't the best parts of the story occur when the tale superficially has come to an end? She liked the idea of a story's continued reverberation. She liked to return to a story to mark the place where it made her feel, where it continued to play inside her rib cage, stutter, and sigh, indeterminate and unsettled. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Wow. Thank you to both of you, my goodness. Wow. It wasn't too long. So again, typically we stay for a few minutes and talk a little bit and if anybody has any questions for either of our readers, please feel free. 
I, I, I would like to say something to Tere, and I, I don't know if this is a question, but I love your response to it. And, and that is you're working right now in forms, as you talked about writing in forms. And, you know, of course, we've all read forms from poems, poems through the centuries. And I'm reading a lot of poems in forms right now, going back to the 10th and 11th centuries, etc. But the best of it seems to me when you don't feel like the writer is trying to do what a form requires, you feel like the writer is getting the form to do what the writer needs. And I felt that way listening to your work. I wasn't at all worried about the form. I mean, the form was doing what you needed it to do. And I thought that was really brilliant. And thank you. Thank you. That's really, um, that's really sweet. And I appreciate that. Um, I also, um, I, I, I agree um, that like, I think that when I think back in the past, maybe why, why I wasn't like drawn to forms was because it always felt like rules um, as opposed to tools. And um, once it felt like a tool that I could use, then I felt like it was something that could aid in my writing as opposed to like giving me like um, unnecessary like restrictions to my writing. So nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, I might say apropos of that, that <clears throat> what you're doing, Erica, with the, with the Shahrazad and the story, maybe is a little bit in that vein also. It's interrogating and wrestling with the form, story as a form, as a kind of imminent form, and trying to bend it towards one's own. And I don't know if that's the right thing to say, but uh, it seems no, like... I am yeah. I am playing with this idea of the parable for sure. And because I tried to uh, figure out how to tell a story. I used to love stories. And then I haven't, you know, as a poet, I don't tell too many stories. But so I decided, well, what if I do that? And then it, um, then it, something else kind of drove it a little bit. Um, some portion of this deals with the, um, oh, God. So, you know, just various stories that have come to me. But one uh, set of stories has to do with the uh, women in northern Nigeria, the young the young women in northern Nigeria who were um, kidnapped um, and were uh, really away from their homes for almost two years, the first group, and um, they they kept a common notebook. <laughs> yeah, so they wrote their what was happening in a common notebook, which they hid. So it's one story is their story. It's a composite, and I got very interested in that. The, that kind of um it's not an individual narrator it's actually a collective story so thinking about that and the story not as the you know mm -hmm. no one necessarily in charge of it but the many voices it's not an i story not an i story mm -hmm. is this great layering in the recent work you read um erica because you're you're doing the telling of the telling of stories or the telling of the telling of lies. And, you know, I, I had a couple of thoughts. One is that, you know, when I was growing up my, to my mother used to always say, now don't tell stories and then yes. don't tell lies. That's <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> and um, it, it, it struck me that just like somebody might say fiction is a lie that tells a truth tells or a many truth. truths. And I thought that, your stories of stories were both stories that interrogated the lie, but in, end up interrogating the truth too. And I think it's just the, the, the complexity of that and yet clarity of it at the same time is incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Kenny. I had a, a question for Tere and then I wanted to say something about uh, Eric about one thing that you read. So are you, the stuff you read is, did you say that this is what you were writing now that you're not writing? Because if you're not writing, that's a lot of, but anyway, it's, it's incredible new work, you know, so so keep not writing, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think I will actually, Tenny. Yeah, I, I will keep not writing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it definitely feels like that. Um, you know, it feels like at some point, like maybe I started, um, maybe just like out of, 
just like the innocence of just being young, like writing to an audience, right? Or writing to um, like the desire to be seen or writing to validation. Um, and I'm not doing that anymore. Um, now I'm just like writing to get free. And so I don't really know what to call myself right now. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, and and I think that that's okay. Like, I think that that's okay. Um, and so I'm just kind of owning that. And um, yes, but uh, as far as like pen and paper, um, I, I think that that's just something that I'm always going to, yeah. it, it comes easier than talking. So I yeah. think I'll, yeah. I'll always do that. Yeah, yeah thank you. It seems, it seems way okay. You know? And then I, Erica, for the, for the decolonized autobiography, um, I was glad that Charles read the, the Harriet Mullen blurb to local history, which I've always loved. And the, what it talks about sort of, you know, blowing the personal and the public in, inside out, because w- what it seems to point to in local history is there's a the kind of effortless way in which that happens. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, it, there's no strain through that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and that's really what I felt with the decolonized autobiography and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the connection to parable in a way, because it feels just, um, it doesn't feel like it's trying to be parabolic at all. You know, it's just, just a story and it feels, um, completely i don't know like it you know like it's blowing the personal and the public inside out i mean it seems so revelatory without any uh effort in in that direction so yeah mm-hmm. thank you thank you mm-hmm. 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 um i have a question for erica i mean because why not we are in a <laughs> yeah so not all the rules before <laughs> don't matter anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess um, Eric, I was so inspired by like not only but like what Charles like um, like gave like such like a really like beautiful like visual of like your body of work, um, and I really loved like hearing um, your new work and also I loved the storytelling in it. But I wanted to know that like if your poetry could talk, what would you think that they would think that? Um, like your biggest lesson um, to learn is? Mm. Mm. So, so repeat, say that a different way, that question, because I feel like there was, there've been several lessons to learn, you mm. know, over time, they're never the quite the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but what do you mean right now? What's the biggest lesson yeah, I guess like sometimes I think um, like if my poems could talk, like what would they think that I would need to learn right now? Um, you know, uh, I see. Uh-huh. I see. Like I see. Me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? Uh, one of the th- I I my mind went one place because of something you said earlier, which is about audience. Like, who's the audience? Right. And for a moment, for a period of time, I couldn't figure out who my audience was, and it kind of paused me. You know, I mean, it didn't pause me as a writer because I continued to write, but it paused me for publication. And that wasn't an easy question for me to answer. So I really feel like I, over time, I've, you know, and then Charles once, uh, Charles B. blurbed on my book, this, this, this writing demands a new audience. So I was like, yeah, who is the audience? For this besides public, people who know me it's, you know a new public a new public and i thought who yeah who is it and that and that that question of audience can be kind of uh you know you write on your own steam because it's so much fun and because by writing you figure out what it is you know you you're surprised by it right i am if if it's happening i get surprised by it i go whoa where did that come from i didn't know i knew that I didn't know I thought that. Is that true? I mean, I just go over. That's exhilarating in itself. But then once it becomes out there, then who the hell are you talking to? Who is one talking to? So I, that was, that was every, and the poem still kind of, that, that's not as loud in my ears as it was, but it was very loud to the point of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, stalling me mm-hmm. in publication. So yes, my quest, my poems still say, who are you talking to? Like when I, I just had a, I had a, a uh, conference with a thesis student just now. And at one point in his poem, he says, fuck you. And I said, what? Who are you talking to? Says, oh, I think that I said, you're talking to me? I looked over my shoulder. I said, 
who is he talking to? Fuck you. What? You know, <laughs> I agree with you. Why are you telling me fuck you? You know, it's like, you know, this is a revolutionary poet. So I, I really feel that that's, uh, that's what the, even the poem I began with, reader, we were meant to meet, mm. right? Yeah. Even if I get dodgy and you don't, and one, the reader can't follow me everywhere, I always know that the, I always am sure that the reader somewhere will follow me somewhere, even in one line. And then the rest can be, let's talk. Let's get to know each other. Let's get to know what the moves are, uh, what, how this poem moves. What is this art piece, this work doing and what it's, you know, what is it doing? Let's figure that out. But what? But not fuck you, as I told my. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Letters to the future is another way you formulate that, though, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Could I just say one more thing? I mean, I think one of the one of the great things about what what Charles wrote, you know, about the, you know, the, that it demands a new public is that it, it feels to me like that, like that in some way, the, the question of who it's addressing and the kind of unsettled quality about that is, is, is really in a way what the work is doing and what it's about, you know, that it really is sort of calling, calling something like a new public into being. And if, and if it doesn't exist yet, and so there isn't, you know, you wouldn't know exactly which four mile turf to be in to find your audience, you know, that feels like what it's doing in some way. So. Yeah. I, not to be optimistic, which I really don't like to be in general, but in this particular case, I believe that between 1980 and 1990 and 2022, that the public that I was thinking of does exist to a greater extent Yeah, yeah. for your yes. particular yeah. work. Yeah. And, and you so experienced that yourself. And I think um, yeah. that must be an interesting thing, too, because I think really it, it, I understand what you're saying earlier, but now I feel the specific kind of intersection that you have been involved with uh, does have, I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> mass culture, but I, but still a public that I meant, I think does exist now that didn't. Yeah, I would agree. And Don't I, you have a title, Charles, like the Republic of Poetry? Uh, well, no, well, Republics of Reality. Republics of Reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I kept thinking we we're talking about a new public. If we can build a new public, can we build a new republic? <laughs> <laughs> we're not reality. What is the question, Terry? I want to turn that question around to you. Um, the question that you oh. posed to me. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I just think that this is such an opportune time um, to read with you, and I feel really grateful to you. Thank you first um, for shining a light so for the public sure. like myself can find our way home. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in many ways you shine the light so that we can become the new public. And I don't know, I, I appreciate that. Um, I think um, that that question, I didn't, it just popped in my head. So I just figured why not ask it. Um, but I don't know. I think what my writing would say um, that I would need to learn right now is probably to um yeah yeah that's a tough one um probably yeah. to uh, <laughs> to um just let like let, let, just let things be mm -hmm. um just to just to accept what is um yeah. i think that because i may not look like a well i mean quite literally like i've literally transitioned but also like in my work right um <clears throat> like choosing to um, yeah, choosing my mental health and, um, you know, choosing to unpack like, uh, you know, the PTSD that came from that incident also meant yeah. that I, like, you know, couldn't necessarily work the way that I used to. It also meant that I couldn't, you know, necessarily have to be very careful about like the performances that I choose so that it doesn't like trigger um, mm -hmm. you know, flashbacks and things like that. And so um, that's what that meant, right? As opposed to just, you know, ignoring it and pretending it to go away. Um, so I think like what comes with that for me um, <clears throat> is it's also changed like how I would define a poet or what I, what I thought my life would look like right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that what my poems and, you know, um, the poems now, right? Because they're just written and they don't, like they're not written to publication or they're not written anywhere. They're just kind of mm -hmm. here. I think that they're just trying to teach me like it's okay to just be. And yes. whatever that yes. is, is acceptable. And even- yes. 
even in the midst of all like categorizing yourself outside of a binary, it's all just, you're just being human. This is just what yes. it's like. Yes, yes, yes. Being is a radical idea. <laughs> a lot of there's a lot of value on doing, not so much on being. You know, it's like, right. <laughs> mm. Erica, um, if I heard right, one of your earlier poems talked about a double or your double. I yeah. may not have heard right. Okay. Yep. Um, and it kind of brought me back to that Zora Neale Hurston reader that Charles yes. held up. And um, he didn't, I don't know if we have the same edition, but on the back this of mine, you popular. see. I love myself. That's the word. The, the, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You see the rest of the title on the back. And, and when I'm being mean and impressive, something yeah, about right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Uh, and then and again, again when, when I am looking mean and impressive, mean and impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that made me think of that kind of double and mm -hmm. oh, all the different facets that come mm -hmm. come through when you mm -hmm. bear your soul. Mm -hmm. I think we so much contain um, many people in, inside of one person, so it's. You know, and uh, to be, to to be in love is to be outside of oneself for a time, and then to come back, and settle in. It's like it's a suspension of disbelief. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> okay, let me play along with this. <laughs> I like because it's titled "The Fool for a uh, Fool for Love," right? You know. It's this, one of my great experiences was performing that with That's Marty right. for you. That's right. That you was did. really great. And the he came over here, we rehearsed such a wonderful <laughs> poem, but actually to perform that for you in, yeah, our, yeah, yeah. in our particular improvised way. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Sweet, let's say, not do anything for love. That's right. Yeah, but I won't do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's. Um, Meatloaf. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. only know that because I didn't know anything about Meatloaf, and I listened to that today because I didn't know who it was, oh. and that's the I heard that that song. <laughs> Meatloaf. So, this is so lovely. I I I'm very um, glad to have read with you today this evening and to have heard your work and your voice. That's a important moment for me. So thank you. Yeah. Um, likewise, it is a huge honor um, to read alongside you. Um, and yeah, I just feel really grateful. Um, also to have a space to also ask questions. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? I'm happy just to linger here and look at everybody. Really I, know we have, <laughs> I know we have to wait for the Shahrazad book, but any plans for when that might be uh, in front of us? What Shahrazad? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is yeah yeah my uh, I have a <laughs> I have two or three projects going on at once, but um, but Shahrazad is something I've been you know I worked on this summer and I'm hoping to continue and you know there are you know, folks who will do something with it. But, um, and I'm I'm still listening to it. I can hear already words that I want to cross out, you know, <laughs> too many and things like that. So I'm still, things take a little while to yeah. gestate. I think you have to sing it, you know, you have to sing it and then you'll know, yeah. Yes, yeah, right, right. Anyway. Yeah, I feel like one thing that happens to me as I get, older when younger and I would say I want to read some new work it was new like the last few days yeah, yeah. New work is anything <laughs> in the last three or four years yes. yeah right yeah publishing right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right no this this is not too old this is summer summer was the last concentrate what's funny is that I, I then decided okay let me take a fiction workshop I'm interested in story so I took this fiction workshop and I submitted it and they said that's not 
know the story. <laughs> yeah. They said, what is this? Where are the where are the details? Where are the, you know, and part of it is because when they tell a story, when a fiction writer thinks of a story, right? Beginning, middle, end. Well, well, he's yeah. he's, he's writing in a form, in, in a way, and uh, you know, and some of my favorite fiction writers, I don't do know, that. me Beckett, too. People didn't well, write yeah. forms in that a way. lot of people. A lot of people tell stories this way, but they're not quite stories. They really are, you know, fiction writers. Or this was an orthodox, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fiction is not a style; it's a profession. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Is there an official fiction culture like an official verse culture? Ooh. There is an official fiction culture. <laughs> I, I uh, realized I thought, you know, the, the useful thing, I mean, I'll just blab on if you let me. Um, the useful thing about this fiction workshop was this idea of consecution and swerve. Consecution. It, yes, it's a, so what it is is, and it's a poet, it's a poet's idea, frankly. It's like, Repeat, you know, have the figure tell the story, have that figure in another form occur again, have the figure occur. So A, B, C, swerve the fourth time or the third iteration. Surprise, jolt, turn it. Except that it doesn't sound like that uh, fiction writer really understand swerve in the way you do. I mean, yeah, I know. That's the problem. Because, yeah, swerve. <laughs> when I say swerve, like, well, I love it. Swerve. Right? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Off like that. But swerve. No, we didn't mean swerve but, in that way. We just meant right. We didn't mean swerve, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it is, a, you know what it is? It's a um, uh, Gordon Lish idea. So Gordon Lish, the famous editor, Raymond Carver, short stories. So it's, so, and actually when you start to look at Raymond Carver stories structurally, you see that there's this kind of, and also uh, James McBride does this too, Color of Water, other, um, you know, um, there's this kind of pattern that's set up. And then, and then the third time, or when you're expecting it, the pattern is set up a certain amount of expectations, Mm -hmm. then it kind of turns. So this was the useful idea out of this workshop. However, <laughs> as you, as Charles B. just said, their idea of swerve was a lot different than the poetic idea of swerve. Well, or Lucretius, the Klinemann, with atoms colliding in space, is that's the swerve of poetry, or of the, or of the, the cosmos, or of a, of a, a poesis, right. Yeah. And this is what makes poetry poetry, in effect. In fact, our swerve, our set, our our sense of setting up the pattern, right? Whether it's, you know, like repeating the I or repeating, you know, the first part of a phrase and getting everybody on, and we're all on the train and we're riding. And then all of a sudden, our surprise, our delight at the swerve. Mm-hmm. Right, our delight okay. because it's changed. The pattern has changed, and and it builds our, you know, um, mm-hmm. a pleasant, yeah. a pleasant jolt, you know, or not so pleasant yeah. jolt actually, oh, or it could be whatever. But the jolt actually breaks up <laughs> our sense that we are the routine that we know yeah. what's happening. Yeah, pretty soon we're the swerve, and yeah. and, and that often <laughs> I think happens in a way that even surprises the poet when writing it. Yes, you know? and, that's and it right. Should. And it should. Mm. Right. Yeah. No. Mm. Okay. Well, wow. thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you thank for you. being here, yeah. Erica and Ture. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, thank I hope you. to see you again thank in you. this space. Yes. Good to meet those of you I'm meeting for the first time. Yeah. And Good to see old friends as well. Well, I'm ready to write. I don't know about y'all. I'm ready ready to go. Let's do this. Yes. Um, It was really great to um, be here tonight. Um, And if you're in Tucson, drink water. And if you're not in Tucson, stay warm. Yes. (laughs) That's Uh, right. That's right. And be safe. And yeah, I'll see you all, I'm sure, soon. To see you, Terry. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye-bye. You, Bye-bye. thank Bye-bye. you, Erica. Yeah, thank you. Bye, Beth. Good night, everybody. Bye.
Bye, yeah. Charles. Thank you. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Charles and Cynthia. Bye bye. Bye, David. Beth. Bye bye. Nice to meet you, Beth. Like in real life. Bye, Tenny. <laughs> Stephen. Okay. So long. So long. So long. Mm -hmm.